and welcome uh, online. Um, so when I was, Pranya Manas asked me to give this talk, he said, could I talk about another talk uh, uh, that Bante gave, a classic uh, Bante talk uh, that Bante gave in 1979. Actually, initially, when Pranya Manas, he, he came into my room to say, could I give a talk on this Monday? And I was about to say, uh, no, uh, <laughs> because I, um, I've just come back um, from a solitary retreat, and I thought, oh, I'm going to have lots to catch up on, and da 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 da. Uh, and I was about to say no, and then he said, could I give it on this talk that Bante gave in 1979 on Padma Sambhava Day? And I knew I had to say yes, because uh, it's such a tremendous classic talk, even by Bante's standards. I've been listening to it, re listening to it uh, today. Um, so it's a bit odd to try and give a talk about a classic talk uh, that really I should just point, give you a link to. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, uh, so, so if anything that I say inspires you, then I'd really urge you to follow up. Uh, if you look on Free Buddhist Audio, uh, it's, and you have to type in Padma Sambhava on the Google thing, the talk doesn't really have a title, it's just Padma Sambhava Day 1979 by Sangharakshita. Padma Sambhava, and we've got an image <coughs> of Padma Sambhava at the feet of the Buddha on the shrine, was a very important figure for Bhante. Uh, in, um, uh, like Bhante was ordained, first of all, as a, a Theravadan uh, monk, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the Theravadan tradition. Um, but he was open to uh, the whole of Buddhism. Uh, he was an unusually uh, unusual practitioner, in a way, one of the first practitioners, I would say, to be open to the whole of the Buddhist tradition. And many of his teachers, um, he had eight main teachers, and many of them were Tibetan practitioners, and many of them were from the Nyingma school in Tibetan Buddhism. And Padma Sambhava is a central figure for the Nyingmas, so much so that he's called the second Buddha by uh, the Nyingma uh, tradition. Um, there, are, there are sort of four main schools in Tibetan Buddhism, the Nyingma school being one of them. And most of Bante's Tibetan teachers were from that Nyingma school. And Bante had teachers in India from that school who are regarded now as the most eminent teachers of 20th century Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, um, Bante was initiated in various practices by them, and one of them gave Bante another name. So Bante was already called Sangharakshita when he was ordained in the Theravadan tradition, and he was wearing the yellow robes of a Theravadan monk. Uh, and he was given this other name, which was Urgyen, Urgyen is the land, that, the mythical land, that Padmasambhava is said to have come from. It's Padmasambhava's land. Another name for it in Tibetan is Udiyana. So uh, he was given this name, Urgyen. He, when Bhante first came across an image of Padmasambhava, I can't remember the year, so we're in the 1950s somewhere, he said that so, so he comes across this in Darjeeling, in a, in a, in a Gompa, in a Tibetan temple in, in Darjeeling. He comes across, uh, there's a temple, I've been there, uh, uh, where there's a huge uh, uh, rupa of Padmasambhava. And Padmasambhava is a sort of p particularly uh, striking looking figure. In a way, he doesn't look like any other Buddhist archetypal figure that you've seen. Uh, come and have a look at him on the shrine here. He's, he's, he's um, dressed in three robes, a, a yellow one, a blue one, uh, actually a blue one in, in, as, as the inner robe, and then a yellow robe, and then this red cape, symbolising the Hinayana, the Mahayana, and the Vajrayana, uh, not in that order. He wears this, this lotus, red lotus cap, with, a, with a, uh, a feather, a vulture's feather. It's said that the vulture... Sometimes it's the eagle's feather, is um, the bird that flies highest. He, um, he's got boots on 
he's he's sort of on a red lotus. He's he's Padmasambhava means lotus born. He's born, as it were, of a lotus, spiritually reborn of a lotus. I haven't got time to talk about his biography, his life so much. There's this whole um, uh, book uh, called The Life and Liberation of Padmasambhava, full of uh, stories from a bizarre, bizarre life. Um, but in his right hand, I am just sort of want to describe him a bit, he's holding a Vajra. In particular, in, in a mudra like this, he's holding a Vajra, which is um, being held in, in the mudra that is called the demon slaying mudra the demon slaying gesture. And he's looking at you, directly looking at you, with a slight frown and a slight smile. It's like he's not too pleased with you, and yet he's a figure of compassion. Yeah? So he's, he's like, he is an embodiment of love and compassion, but he is challenging you. He looks directly at you with a slightly wrathful frown. He's an imposing figure. In his other hand, he's holding uh, a, a skull cup, which is uh, a cup made from the top of a skull. And in that skull cup is red liquid, which is blood, but also nectar of immortality. In his crook of his left hand, his left arm, there's a trident. A tr he's, he's, he's in, in, if you came across him in, in church, He'd be, he'd be uh, an image for Satan. This trident with three severed heads. There's a freshly severed head, a rotting head, and then a skull on this trident in the crook of his arm. He's a figure of considerable strange mystery, majesty, uh, and, and um, he's imposing this long, dark, blue-black Hair that flows from him. Now, he's historical and mythical. Um, uh, the Indian tradition didn't really differentiate between myth and history. Uh, it, that's a sort of modern Western kind of concept. He's both. He's an archetype and he is said to have been a historical figure in, eighth, in lived in the 8th century. Um, he, I'll, I'll say more about him in a bit, but yes, Bante particularly has had a connection with him. Uh, he said that when he saw this figure of Padmasambhava for the first time in Darjeeling, it was a figure that he immediately, he'd never seen before, and yet it felt he recognised it. He said it was infinitely strange and infinitely familiar, familiar to him as m more than his own self. Uh, and Bante didn't use words lightly. Every one of those words would have been weighted, uh, familiar as his own self. So Padmasambhava is um, uh, uh, very important in Tri Ratna to the extent that all over Tri Ratna we celebrate, uh, uh, well, we mark uh, one particular day, we celebrate Padmasambhava on Padmasambhava Day in. Um, in the autumn, all over Tri Ratna. And in 1979, shortly after the opening of the LBC, Bante was sitting, presumably where I, I wasn't here, I was, I was younger. Uh, he, was, uh, he gave a talk on Padmasambhava Day in 1979. And unlike most of Bante's talks, it wasn't written out. Bante uh, extemporised. And uh, it's very sort of, it's unpolished, this talk, and very alive. Uh, uh, very powerful. Um, so I'd recommend that. So in the talk, so I'm just going to draw from themes from that, that talk, and I'm going to touch on this other figure um, who's sitting sort of underneath at the foot of Padmasambhava, who is called Vajrakilaya, Vajrakilaya. Uh, and I'm going to uh, uh, draw on this rather ferocious figure. Bante was really rather... Um, wary of introducing wrathful figures in in a public class at a Buddhist centre, uh, you could get the wrong idea about Buddhism from these wrathful figures. Uh, I'm going to do it anyway. Yes. <laughs> so uh, if you get the wrong idea, if you get nightmares tonight, you, that was that was the sort of warning, yeah? trigger warning. <laughs> 
Um, so in, in order to talk about Padmasambhava, well, Bhante first of all says, look, why, why is he called the second Buddha? It just doesn't make sense, because the Buddha is said to be somebody who discovers enlightenment at a time when enlightenment has uh, been forgotten about. So he rediscovered. So how can you have a second Buddha when the first Buddha is um, uh, his teaching is still alive? And and Bhante says, well, in a way, it's just saying that he's valued by the Nyingmas as highly as the Buddha, or almost as highly as the Buddha. Now, Padmasambhava is the guru archetype. He's the guru principle embodied. And uh, in order to explain what the guru is, Bhante says we need to look at three other archetypes, three other archetypes that sort of contextualize the guru archetype. Yep. Uh, and so in this talk, Bhante does that. He talks about the three other archetypes or figures are the Manu, the Buddha, then there's the Guru, and then there's another archetype called the Turtan. The Turtan is particularly a Tibetan term, uh, but the Manu and the Buddha are, are um, uh, well, they're, they're known all over Buddhism, as it were, and, and the Guru, of course. So the Manu, the Manu, uh, I, was, I was giving a talk like this uh, a while ago, and I was sort of, I suddenly, my, my dad died when I was very young, uh, uh, 11, but his name was Manu. And uh, so it's a bit odd talking about Manu, uh, 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 because Manu means the lawgiver, and my dad was the lawgiver. <laughs> uh, not always in a, in a you know, way that I liked. Uh, <laughs> Well, I didn't, actually. <laughs> uh, the Manu is said to be the, 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 the sort of archetype that creates a society that is ready to hear the teaching of the Buddha. So, so you need a, a culture and a society that is receptive to the teaching of the Buddha. So, so what Bhante says is that, look, India in the days of the Buddha, two and a half 2,600 years ago, had a very refined and highly developed culture. For example, there were, there were uh, um, complex and developed and articulated uh, philosophies. Uh, India today, if, even today, everybody has a spiritual teacher, everybody has a spiritual life. Uh, you know, if, you're, if you've travelled in India today, it's not unusual to be asked by a stranger on a train, who is your teacher? Uh, that, that's just taken for granted. That's quite a, quite a sort of civilised, from a Dharmic perspective, a civilised culture. So, there's interesting sort of... Um, uh, there was a degree of um, uh, hospitality in India that you still can encounter, particularly, I'm told, in rural India, a great deal of... Uh, courtesy and hospitality. The debates that uh, philosophers had, you, you get a sense that it was a bit like, I guess, I guess, sort of Athens, ancient Athens, where people were talking about the meaning of life and having discussions and debates, but very politely, uh, a, a, a culture of politeness, of uh, receptivity, of gratitude. Now, the Manu is responsible, as it were, for establishing that sort of culture. And I think that Bhante has been a bit of a Manu for us. I think what he's trying to do, what he tried to do in establishing the LBC and in Tri Ratna, and what we're still trying to do is create a culture where people are living ethical lives, for example. They're, 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 they're living by the principles of... Uh, the five precepts of kindness, of generosity, of contentment, of truthfulness, of awareness, of mindfulness. They're, they're trying to relate to each other in the spirit of friendship and create a community in that spirit. They're trying to take responsibility for their own minds and their own behaviours. So rather than have a culture which I think in, in our outside world, there's increasingly a culture of blame. Certainly, I'm, I'm, I'm now in my 50s, I was going to say mid-50s, it's late 50s, and I've seen this culture of blame grow in, in the last couple of decades. 
Uh, we're trying to create a culture of responsibility, where we take responsibility for our own actions, our own mind, and forgive uh, others. Do, do, do you see what I mean? That's very different from saying, uh, I was, uh, uh, it was your fault, I was aggrieved, and it's your fault, I take offence, and it's your fault. Uh, and or, or my parents' fault, or whoever's fault it is. We're trying to create a culture where people have responsibility for their own actions, their own lives, uh, are, are willing to forgive others, are trying to work in cooperation, in harmony, uh, in kindness. Uh, that's, that's, um, if that's all we could do at the LBC, that would be a gift uh, to... Uh, the modern world, I think. And tree, that's not just the LBC. Tree Ratten is, a, as you know, now a worldwide international movement. And I think that that in itself is a gift. And I think man, the Manu uh, is, is sort of part of that. In India, Bante said that Dr. Ambedkar uh, is, was a modern-day Manu in that he um, uh, challenged the caste system. Uh, he actually helped overturn the caste system for... Uh, hundreds of thousands of people who are at the uh, bottom of the caste heap yeah, by uh, converting to Buddhism and by them converting to Buddhism too. He set up a momentum, a Dharma revolution that sets up uh, a, a whole current of um, social, peaceful uh, social disruption to the Hindu system, which is based so much on caste. So I was born in a Hindu family, and um, uh, I, I never particularly sort of took up Hinduism, but of course it influenced my, you know, my cultural upbringing. It was shot through with <laughs> Hinduism. And I didn't realise that Hinduism was so... that caste was so... Um, uh, endemic in Hinduism until I came across Buddhism because the Hinduism that I came across in in England really was fairly benign if a bit wacky uh, um, and I couldn't take it too seriously I'm afraid uh, but I didn't sort of take it seriously either way whereas actually what I've learned subsequently is that underneath that benignness which you can get in India, there's also a grade, graded system of cruelty, a hierarchy that is, is for, for the people at the bottom, that's hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people at the bottom of that hierarchy. Uh, they're treated worse than animals uh, and have been for thousands of years. Anyway, so Dr. Ambedkar converted to Buddhism and Bhante says he was a modern-day Manu. Now, Bhante, I think, was a modern-day Manu himself. He wouldn't, of course, say that um, uh, about himself, but I think he was. Anyway, that's, I, I could go on about what a Manu is, but I, I want to move on. So then you get the Buddha. So the Manu, as it were, prepares the ground for a Buddha to, to, to uh, arrive. And a Buddha is somebody, as I said earlier, who rediscovers the transcendental, the doorway to the transcendental. He, he opens that door when it had been forgotten and uh, uh, shows people the path to enlightenment, to that doorway. The, the transcendental is an experience of complete liberation that goes beyond the physical senses and the rational mind, our normal mind, uh, even the irrational mind. It goes beyond our normal mind. It's a liberation, and you could say it's an experience. Experience is the best word we have, perhaps, but actually it's not personal. It's beyond... Uh, uh, me and you. It's beyond subject and object, self and other. So what, what's it mean to have an experience that isn't centred on uh, a self? The experience arises when you see that this notion of a, of a self, of a me, is a construct. Uh, that's not to say that we don't exist, but we don't exist in a fixed and separate way. There is no fixed and separate entity that I can call me. We are part of a flowing process that is also this whole cosmos, you could say. We're, we're interwoven. Uh, we don't exist as we think we do. Uh, and enlightenment opens up when we realise that really, really deeply. The Buddha opens that door. And he teaches. And he teaches 
primarily, or at least uh, our Buddha did, he teaches um, using, I guess, both images, but also mainly concepts that appeal to our rational mind. So he, the Buddha says, look, you are um, uh, suffering. Life is unsatisfactory. Uh, and there's a reason for that, and that's because we're deluded and we're not seeing things as we are, etc., etc. So he's appealing to our reason. And, and uh, the Buddha lays out the principles of the path to enlightenment in, in um, uh, reasonable terms. That, so you don't have to abandon your reason. You, eventually you have to go beyond your reason, but that doesn't mean abandoning um, your reason along the path. And the Buddha uh, gives us those teachings and principles that primarily, according to Bhante, appeal to the rational mind. Uh, and he says that in a certain sense, a Buddha doesn't have very much time. So our Buddha became enlightened at the age of 35 and he lived for another 45 years. So he taught for 45 years as an enlightened uh, uh, as a Buddha, uh, that isn't a great deal of time to convert mm. humanity to from samsara to nirvana to convert us. So he does what he can in the time that he's got, which is to lay out the foundations of the path. Yeah, but what Bante is saying is that look, that might get us started, but. If you start to practice Buddhism, you might come along to a Buddhist center like this and think, yeah, I need to learn to meditate because I've heard it's good for me. And then you start meditating and actually you encounter uh, lots of resistance or you encounter, or you go on retreat and you can have a great time on retreat and then you come off retreat and you don't want to practice. Has anybody had that experience? Like you've had a great time on retreat. It's felt the most meaningful time. Uh, it's been so important that you can see that you need to completely transform your life. This is the way to live. And you come back and you want to watch Netflix. Yeah, There's nothing about Buddhism that is uh, 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 on your mind when you come off retreat. I've just come off retreat. Actually, I haven't watched Netflix. Uh, but I, I have felt this resistance. And guess what? Even on the retreat, I was on a solitary retreat for uh, three weeks at Vajrasana. I was, I was loving it. Uh, there were times, I was mostly very happy, but there were times when I went deeper into meditation or even outside of meditation where I saw the truth of the Dharma more clearly, more deeply than I have before and I felt completely opened up. And uh, at times I can remember on one walk feeling, I mean, I've had this before, that I felt the most fortunate person alive. Uh, the most fortunate. I could not believe that I was alive and had practiced it. The next day, I can't get to bed in the morning. Uh, I don't want to meditate. Uh, there's all this resistance suddenly kicks in, and you think, Yanavacha, who are you? What are you? Because you're not very integrated. So I don't think I'm alone in that. I don't think I'm alone in that because we're not integrated and we're not really. Uh, very rational. We're not really, reason doesn't go very deep in us. Mostly we're a bundle of instincts and many of our instincts are uh, based on uh, a craving and aversion, greed and hatred, uh, um, likes and dislikes, wanting pleasure, not wanting pain. Uh, we're animal instincts. We're, we're, we're you know, we're, we are really fallen angels and risen apes in a certain sense. And, uh, on, on retreat and off retreat, you can encounter both dimensions. We're much bigger than we are. I think sometimes people who don't meditate live in a much narrower bandwidth. Uh, maybe. I, this is me speculating. I, when I came along, thought I was sort of a fairly normal, nice guy. And then you start meditating, you discover all these, this kind of fury I discovered inside me that wasn't so nice. Uh, actually, people around me probably had discovered it before I did, but uh, my mum had, anyway. Uh, that wasn't so nice. But what happens is that as, you, as more of you comes into play, there's, you realise that actually there's heights and depths to you. The heights are higher than you'd imagined, and the depths are deeper than you'd imagined. And the function of the guru is to integrate all of those energies. 
particularly the guru is there to integrate the depths that aren't open to reason, the parts of you that don't want to practice Buddhism or meditate or practice ethics or study the Dharma, even though you've had a heart response to it and you know that it makes sense. Uh, uh, nod if you know what I'm saying. Good. Uh, you can nod at home as well if you want. So, so the guru activates the deeper, you could say darker, energies in us that don't want to listen to the Dharma. Yeah? We all have those energies. They're activated and then they're subdued or transformed into the service of the Dharma. Yeah? So it's like the Buddha um, can't do it alone. Even the Buddha needs the guru. Or, I mean, not the Buddha needs the guru. The Buddha did it alone. The Buddha can't help us to, on his own. We need the guru principle. And Padmasambhava is that guru principle. So, for example, now Padmasambhava lived in the 8th century. He lived in India. He was born, in, born on a lotus, actually. So he was found on a lotus as an 8-year-old child. So his life story is shot through with, with myth. But he was... Um, studying he was one of the sort of teachers monks teachers i don't know at nalanda university in india you can still visit the ruins of nalanda nalanda was the first university in the world i mean a huge complex i've been to the ruins of nalanda it was i think sacked desecrated burnt down in the maybe the 12th century i'm not completely sure anyway padmasambhava was based at nalanda in the 8th century he was a scholar he was a uh, um, uh, uh, um, he was also a sort of tantric master uh, he he's he's called a magician in a way he's a, he's like a shape-shifting magician he could he was an occult you know master of the arts of magic of the occult as well as uh, uh, um, a teacher of studying um, the Buddha's teaching and teaching it, etc. Anyway, the, he was quite happily doing his thing at Nalanda. Meanwhile, in Tibet, um, Buddhism uh, had been introduced into Tibet, but was sort of dying out, was, was sort of on the decline. Apart from the king in Tibet, um, was Buddhist. And he wanted Buddhism to be re-established in Tibet, 8th century Tibet. So he asked uh, uh, for a monk to come over from Nalanda uh, to create and build a monastery in Tibet called Samye Monastery. And the monk that goes over is, wasn't Padmasambhava, not initially. It was Santarakshita, not Sangharakshita, but Santarakshita. Uh, and, and Santarakshita was a scholar. He's, he was an extremely impressive man. He's called the Bodhisattva Abbot. The Bodhisattva Abbot Santarakshita was in charge of the building of Samye Monastery in, in Tibet at the, you know, under the auspices and the um, instructions of the king. And what would happen is they'd build, they'd, they'd, all the construction workers or whatever were building the monastery and they'd take rocks and stones and... and uh, build this thing during the day and at night it would be all their, their stones and rocks would be taken down by the local demons and put back into wherever they were. So every day they would build on the foundations and every night the building would be destroyed again. Yeah? So, so the king's saying, like, what's going on? And Santa Ratchita's like, I don't know. <laughs> I can't help you. But I know somebody who can. You need Padmasambhava. It's like Ghostbusters, isn't it? You, you need Padmasambhava. So Padmasambhava is sent for by the king of Tibet. And uh, he, he comes to Tibet. And according to some accounts, he doesn't stay in Tibet very long. He stays around 18 months. And most of what he does is subdue the local gods and demons. By subdue, he transforms them into the service of the Dharma. He doesn't kill them. In Buddhism, you wouldn't do that. Not that if you tried, actually, 
to kill a demon, it would probably rise up with even more force. That would be using hatred against hatred or something, violence against violence, and it doesn't work. But he converts them. He does pin them down. Uh, one way that he converts them is that he pins them down and he gets the demon to reveal his or her name, uh, real name. And once the name has been revealed, the demon is under Padmasambhava's power. And then he says, right, you are now going to be a protector of the Dharma rather than a malicious destroyer of the Dharma. So they, they, they all promise to protect the Dharma. And then the monastery goes up. Padmasambhava, you know, as he was, uh, as it were, um, uh, learning this demon um, uh, uh, subduing craft, uh, he would go to cremation grounds in, in India and uh, meditate on corpses uh, or sit on bones. Or, or, and and uh, in the dark, there would be these um, darkeny figures which were uh, sky dancing like, like female wrathful deities. Uh, who would dance around him and he'd teach them the Dharma at night, uh, unafraid in these cremation grounds with these rotting bodies. He'd teach the Dharkanese and convert them. So you can see the symbolism here. Uh, we have demons in us. We have uh, egotism. We have uh, all the the... the, the, the craving and the hatred that stems from that egotism, the pride, the, 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 the arrogance, the jealousy, the resentments, the competitiveness that is unhealthy, all of that are energies within us. And what the guru does, what Padmasambhava does, is saying, look, those energies, you can't destroy them. In fact, to destroy them would, even trying to destroy them would be counterproductive. But that's not the point, because in those energies, there is a lot of potential. You need to harness those forces, those more, more unruly forces, the shadow, you could say, and bring them on board and, and, and un, un, sort of unleash their energy in service and in the direction of the Dharma, integrate them. Does that make sense? That is um, the work of, much of the work of our Dharma lives, and you need a guru to do that. Uh, archetypally, you need somebody to, as it were, help you name your demon and look at your demon or demons uh, uh, with open eyes and with fearlessness or as much courage as you can master uh, and uh, uh, call them up even so that they can come into the light and be transformed. Yeah? That is alchemical work. It's, it's, it's sort of magical work. It is, it's not the work of listening to um, uh, a teaching on the Four Noble Truths and saying, oh yeah, my life is about unsatisfactory uh, and, and I do need to uh, do something about that. Uh, that's all fine to get us going, but it won't be enough if you, if you really want to practice the Dharma. Uh, and and if, you, if you've asked for ordination, uh, we provide a training for ordination where some of this transforma transformative work is done and you are guided in that. You are guided in that transformative work. And then if, I mean, it doesn't finish by the time you're ordained. I wish it did. It doesn't. Uh, but by the time you're ordained, you're seen as somebody who can work with your own demons and carry on that process of in integration. You've got enough resources in you to carry that on uh, for yourself and indeed help others do that same work uh, uh, you can you can sort of do that so um, at least that's the idea so um, what Bante says is look the guru uh, the guru principle at least as embodied by Padmasambhava is needed uh, uh, today as much as uh, ever Partly because the demons haven't gone away 
they're never going to just go away in, internally until we're enlightened. But our world, also the world, uh, is full of them. Yeah? Uh, uh, 21st century Britain is full of them, is full of uh, demons. They are always, uh, they're not always going to uh, appear as demons, as dem demons to you. They will appear in disguise often. They're insidious, they're manipulative. Um, what, what do I mean? Let, let's, let's look at some demons in our world. Uh, internally, I've talked about greed and hatred and so forth, but what about demons in our culture, in our society? Can you think of any forces or demons that are uh, malevolent, mischievous, anti the Dharma? The desire for like, status or... Yeah. The desire for status. Yeah. So status in what sort of sense? Kind of like rec recognition. I guess like pra praise and blame. That sort of yeah. Thing. Like from people around you. Sort of from thing. people around you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, I grew up at a time when there wasn't the internet and there wasn't social media and, and so forth. And you didn't have to worry about your social media profile. Uh, I still don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but if you've been brought up in an age where that's the norm... I mean, imagine how it's affecting school kids, where they're, they're constantly having to worry about not just, you know, how they are, but how they appear to be online to their mates, their friends. That, that's, a, that's a whole other added pressure. So status, how other people view us. Um, uh, doesn't stop at, at kids, does it? Um, uh, we are so driven in our culture by how do we appear to others. <coughs> um, uh, I mean, what sort of things give you high status in our, our culture? Money. Money, yeah. Money, what else? Power. Power. Fame. Sorry? Fame. Fame, yeah. Money, power, fame. Privilege. Privilege. And a beautiful body. <laughs> All of those things... Uh, and, and probably a partner with a beautiful body uh, uh, would give you uh, lots of status. And do you see how seductive all those things are? I, I know that when, you, when you're in the shrine room here and I'm sort of pointing them out and you're pointing them out, we can all laugh at them and think, oh, yeah, you know, money, <laughs> power, those things, you know, that don't really affect me, power, fame, I mean... None of us is going to be famous. Maybe, maybe you are, Pete. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, I'm not bothered about fame or power. And look at me. I'm never going to be beautiful. And it doesn't bother me. But how much does it really govern our lives, those things, those considerations? Yeah? Um, uh, they're, they're, they're more insidious than you think. Uh, what, else is a, what, what else is a demon in our culture? Yeah, consumerism. Consumerism. So this belief, I guess, where does consumerism come from, do you think? I mean, not, not just as a system of, of, of capitalism, but where do you think, what's the underlying view behind consumerism? Lack. Sorry? Lack. Lack, right, yeah, lack. That's good, yeah. And any others? Yes, that we can find happiness in what we buy, what we have, what we consume, what we eat, what we wear, what we, that, 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 that house that we live in, the car that we drive, or, or so forth. That we can find happiness in those things. It's, it's, I think underneath even that might be a view, might be for, for, for many people, a view that material things are all that there are. That... And, and underneath that, there's a view that actually spiritual values are just fantasy. That this world is made of matter. We are made of matter. This body is all there is. And material stuff is all there is. Matter is all there is. And, and consciousness is just a byproduct of the brain. And uh, spiritual, any spiritual um, stuff is just the brain doing its neuron firing thing in a nice way 
and it's all we're all going to once the body dies that's the light's gone out anyway meanwhile while we're in this material world as a material being let's grab as much of it uh that we like uh uh as i can yeah do, do, do you do what i mean it's a complete it's based on uh this sort of um at least this is a sort of uh, one way of thinking about it based on this um, belief that matter is all there is, scientism in a way, and, and um, it's not a scientific belief. Sci- real science, real science is just open to discovering whatever there is, but scientism is uh, a dogma that says matter is all there is, yeah? and matter in a very, very silly um, uh, sense. Um, what, what I mean is that uh, uh, like modern day physics would say we don't understand matter uh, and we don't understand anything actually uh, but we think we're wiser than that and guess what if I can just accumulate enough stuff I'll be happy and I'm, I'm slightly mocking that, that view but I'm prey to consumerism I live in a Buddhist community um, with Amelie Odin and others and my Trishura and there's ten of us uh, in, in the flat upstairs I have a room, uh, you know, reasonable sized room. Uh, I've been there 27 years, and I like stuff. And so I've got, I've got loads of stuff crammed into, and I've just bought, um, uh, sort of while I was on solitary retreat, I managed to do it. <laughs> sort of, that's not quite true. Uh, a painting. Another painting, which I have no real need for. I mean, it's a painting that's by a Biovadra, and you could say it's beautiful and, you know, it's good to support the arts, da 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 But part of me, I was on the men's intensive retreat, leading this retreat, saw this painting, teaching people about how to, you know, go deeper in meditation. My mind was like, I want it, I want it. <laughs> <laughs> and then measuring my room in my mind, thinking, where do I... Where, which <laughs> It's the same impulse, do you know what I mean? It's a slightly more refined thing than buying, I don't know, uh, uh, an iPad. I've got one of those as well, do you know what I mean? So, uh, anyway, consumerism, modern day demon. And, and it is a demon, isn't it? I, we're laughing about it. It's, it seems fairly benign until you consider uh, that the planet doesn't have uh, infinite resources. And uh, loads of people on the planet, the majority of people on the planet, can't just buy iPads and iPhones and don't have the luxury of saying, I like that painting, I'm going to buy it. Uh, um, do, do, do you know what I mean? And those resources are running out with 8 billion of us. And uh, uh, meanwhile, it's, I don't know, we're running out of things and polluting, you know, what was it? That, you know, the, the Mariana Trench, is it? That, um, one of the deepest underwater trenches. I'm, I'm, I'm looking around for help, really. Um, uh, the deepest trench in the, in the oceans in the universe, and they went down there and found a plastic bag. Do, do you know what I mean? I mean, that's, that's, cons- that's not such a pretty face of consumerism. What am I doing for time? Oh, Jesus. So... <laughs> uh, I've got this other figure on the shrine. I want to so so in the life story of Padmasambhava, there are lots of demons. One of them, Bante says, we really ought to know about because uh, he's the demon writ large, um, uh, and he's called Tapa Nagpo. Tapa Nagpo. He's also known as Rudra. Now Rudra is actually a title for a demon, but he's like Rudra with a capital R. Tapa Nagpo. Um, wasn't born a demon. Actually, he was uh, initially a monk uh, practicing Buddhism, and he got the wrong end of the stick with Buddhism. He had a guru who was Padmasambhava in a former life, in a not in a previous sort of life. Uh, and Tarpanagpo was a monk, and th- his teacher said to him. He wanted a teaching whereby he could be really free to do anything he liked. And the teacher at the time wasn't maybe as wise as... Anyway, the teacher said to him, if you can realise the nature of mind, you will see, I don't know how he put it, but the uh, empty nature of all phenomena. 
the illusory nature of all phenomena. And then no phenomena will um, uh, hinder you. And Tapa Nagpo took that to mean he could do what he liked. He could uh, commit uh, uh, as much sex and violence and horror as he liked and it wouldn't touch him. Ethics didn't matter. Now this, this is actually coming back in the 21st um, century. If you look online, you will find teachers who say, once you realize non-dual awareness, ethics doesn't matter. Yeah, watch out for that teaching. The law of karma matters, it's real. Uh, ethics does matter. Uh, so Tarpa Nagpo misunderstood the teaching and went on a, a spree of sex and violence. He does all sorts of very, very horrible things and is born, reborn again and again in hell. Uh, in Buddhism, you've got these hells. They're not permanent, but you can be born into them. Uh, so karmically, he's accumulated so much negative karma. I think he has hundreds and hundreds of life in hell in different hells. He's reborn as a jackal. He's reborn in all sorts of horrible forms um, uh, uh, for 500 lives. He's reborn as a toe sucker, <laughs> which might sound all right, but consider 500 lives of <laughs> sucking feet. Anyway, he's, he's <laughs> and in his, uh, <laughs> it's all there in the life and liberation of Padma Sambhava. It's, it's, uh, you couldn't, you, couldn't, you couldn't make it up. <laughs> uh, in his, um, uh, then finally, he takes this birth as Tarpanapo. Now, now, his mother in this final life is some sort of courtesan who has sex with three gaulish demonic figures. Uh, becomes pregnant and eight months later gives birth to the latest incarnation of Tapa Nagpo, who looks a bit like this figure on the shrine. So she gives, he had three fathers and he's born with three heads, each with three eyes. He has two huge wings, he has six arms and four legs. He's ferocious. And, and, and at his birth, there was plague and famine and earthquakes overtook the land. So, so darkness comes into the land of his birth, at his birth. His, um, nine months after his birth, he falls sick and his mother dies. And the people of the land think, right, we need to get rid of this child. And what they do is they take his mother's corpse and him to a, a cremation ground under a poison tree filled with serpents and other gaulish beasts around and leave him there, I think in a sepulchre, in a, in, a, in a sort of tomb, leave him there with the body of his mother to die. And what this baby does is drink milk from the breasts of his dead mother, this foul, stale, watery yellow milk that sustains him. And then when that runs out, he drinks her blood. And then when that runs out, he eats her flesh and her internal organs and the marrow from her bones and grows and grows and grows and becomes this demon that is... Uh, uh, huge and starts to well collects this army and starts to rule the world so that's quite something isn't it Bandy compares him to Sauron in Lord of the Rings uh, that's the sort of figure that he is in the life and liberation of Padma Sambhava so he's completely unstoppable so even the Buddhas don't know what to do so the Buddhas are sitting in their sort of enlightened realm being Buddhas and they get together and they say what shall we do and they um, emanate they decide that no uh, peaceful um, uh, figure is going to be able to defeat Tarpanagpo 
They need a, a form, an enlightened being, that is as ferocious as Tarpanagpo, even more so. And they emanate this form, which looks a bit like Tarpanagpo, but is called Vajrakilaya. He's huge, and he too has two wings and six arms and three wrathful heads, each with three eyes, but his, and four legs and claws and fangs uh, in each of his heads, in each of his mouths. And he's wreathed in flames, this halo of fire. He's huge. And he carries in his hands implements. Two of his hands carry vajras that can just, like thunderbolts, destroy anything in their path. Another arm is carrying a mass of flame, like a fireball. In another hand, he's carrying a katvanga, like Padmasambhava, this trident with three rotten heads on it. And in his two central hands, it's a demon-destroying dagger that can pin down any demon. And uh, he appears before Tarpanagpo and um, they battle it out and he, he stabs him, uh, 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 Vajrakilaya, with his trident, not with his demon dagger, funny enough. anyway, the tri and then chops him up, Tarpanagpo, he chops up Tarpanagpo and eats him. And uh, inside Tarpanagpo sort of, well not just he, He's not destroyed, because he doesn't get destroyed. Inside his belly, uh, inside the belly of Vajrakilaya, Tapa Nagpo recalls all his previous lives and how much suffering he's caused and how much suffering he's had to endure as a result of his actions and feels this immense remorse and confesses laments and there's this uh, wonderful um, I'm not going to quote from it this wonderful text called the lamentations of Rudra which is his confession from inside the belly I mean actually there are other versions of how Rudra is destroyed uh, uh, Tapa Nagpo is overcome this is just one version uh, um, there's something a bit even ruder actually that goes on <laughs> uh, which I'm not going to go into uh, uh, but in this version Vajrakilaya chops him up eats him uh, Rudra, uh, uh, you know, laments and confesses, and then Vajrakilaya excretes him through his anus, which is very humiliating uh, for a demon to be excreted through the through through that lower orifice. Uh, so by then, Rudra is Tapanagpo is thoroughly subdued <laughs> and uh, uh, feels defeated and uh, uh, regrets what he's done and promises to serve the Dharma, become uh, um, in service of the Dharma. In fact, lays himself down, him and his wife, Rudra has a wife that we won't go into, they both lay themselves down uh, for Vajrakilaya to be, uh, to be cushions for Vajrakilaya under his feet. So if you, if you go, and they look quite happy in this. So come and have a look at this, this Vajrakilaya. Uh, who is the personification of the forces to pin down demons. Yeah. So I, I haven't finished yet, and I'm just going to go on, so I hope you're all right. If, if somebody needs to go, just go. Uh, uh, yeah, just go, but I'm going to carry on. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he pins down... Uh, demons, that's what Vajrakilaya does with his... Um, and in a way, that's what the guru principle is with Padmasambhava. So, so what Bhante says is that uh, that guru principle pins down the demons for a particular time and age. And, and that that principle needs to carry on being alive in all times and in all ages. So Padmasambhava, even Padmasambhava can't do all that work. What happens according to, to the legends is that Padmasambhava buries and hides teachings that are going to be discovered in a future age for a future time. These teachings are called termas. 
they're hidden teachings. He buries them in caves. Some of them take the form of scraps of books uh, and they, they can be discovered. And uh, some of them are more um, like uh, uh, more sort of symbolic objects. And some of them are mind termers that are said to be buried in the nature of mind that an enlightened being will, re, will, will, will discover in their mind. Uh, for a time that is in the future when they're, more, when they're going to be understood and needed. So Padmasambhava is said to have buried throughout India and Tibet and in the nature of reality, termas, hidden teachings that he didn't give at the time. And Turtons, the fourth archetype, are people who discover those teachings in future ages and, and convert demons in their own time and give teachings that are relevant to those times. They're called Turtons. Traditionally, they're emanations of Padmasambhava. And uh, Turton literally means a taker out of the treasure. Uh, the, the terma is the treasure. A turton takes it out and gives it uh, to the world, explains it to the world. And um, in a way, I think Bante's served this function for us. He's been like a turton. I think what he's done is represent the dark. Well, he has done. It's not just what I say or think. He's represented the Dharma for us in our modern 21st century uh, uh, age. And um, Bandhi would never say that he was a Turton. Uh, but when he even talked about these principles, it's sort of, for me, it's like, oh, that's what you are. That's what you've done. Uh, last year, I was on a three-month retreat, um, uh, an ordination retreat that I was helping to lead. And uh, I had a vision of Padmasambhava on that retreat. And I've never had a vision of Padmasambhava, and I don't really have visions very often. And uh, so I'm meditating. I'm not doing. I'm not trying to think of Padmasambhava. I'm just sitting, actually. I'm quite concentrated. And suddenly, he appears, and I know it's him because it sort of. It's quite sort of dark, and but it's definitely him. And what's weird about this vision is that he. I know. I feel I'm look, being looked at. In fact, I feel I'm being seen. It's not like me imagining this figure. It's like this figure is, has appeared and is looking at me with a sort of curious stare, like Padmasambhava's frown and smile. And he's looking at me. And he's just sort of, I'm looking at him, looking at me. And I feel very exposed. And I say in my mind to myself, great guru, please give me a teaching. Which is, you know, a good thing to say. If Padmasambhava <laughs> appears to you, that's what I'd advise you to do. Great guru, in supplication, great guru, please give me a teaching. And he doesn't. He just, he just carries on looking at me in silence. And so I repeat it. I say, great guru, in my mind, great guru, please give me a teaching. And he doesn't. Now, traditionally, if you ask a Buddha three times, they will respond. So I'm thinking, part of me is like, do I, do I, do I, do I want to teach him? I don't know if I want to teach him. <laughs> what if he says, like, get off your backside and practice a lot harder, Dhyanabhacha? Uh, do I want that teaching? I don't know if I want that teaching. Anyway, I, I, I don't, I'm not that conscious, actually. I'm still quite absorbed in the meditation, but there is this sense of trepidation. And I say, one more time, heart in my mouth, great guru, please give me a teaching. And there's an immediate response. There's an immediate response. I, I sort of half hear these words, but it's not even like I hear them. There are four words. They're direct, they're immediate. I wouldn't have thought of them. And it's like there's a voice that's planted these words in my mind. It's not exactly a voice. The words are just somehow there. But they're not my thoughts. They're not my words. So I have said, great guru, give, please give me a teaching. And the four words were, I gave you Bhante. Meaning Bhante Sangharakshita. 
And the tone of voice is, what more do you want, you silly boy? <laughs> was, was the tone. And I was just so shocked that I came out of it. For me, that was the teaching that said, look, I have got the guru. In fact, I've got the turtle. I've got the manu. Uh, and, and, and Bhante has been all of those things for me. And he has pointed to the Buddha. He's, he's made the teachings of the Buddha accessible to me and helped me find practices and a context, or a, a sort of a community and a context, you could say even a world, where I can slowly in my case, and very bit by bit, work on transforming my demons. And that, even though Bhante is no longer alive, is still in Sri Ratna, very much, the force of that is very much alive. It's like a stream of energy that Bhante has channeled, which is the force of the Turtan, you could say of the Guru, and you could say of the Manu, and all of that points you to the Buddha, but makes the Buddha's teachings relevant and applicable right now. And that's what we need to do. And that Bhante finishes by saying, it's not just for us, the world needs us to transform ourselves and to transform the world around us. That's what the world needs. It's in dire, dire straits, the world at the moment. Uh, uh, you might not quite know that, because I, I forget that, because we're in it all the time. All the time we're being, uh, these horror stories you, you read in the news, and, and all the time, it's like we're on the cliff edge. And, and somebody like Tarpa Nagpo, which represents the forces of darkness in samsara, is, is, is all over us and within us, and we need to do something about it. It's urgent, and we need the teachings of the Dharma in a way that we can really practice. I believe that's what Bhante's given us. I believe that's what's alive here at the LBC. That's what I want to help serve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you very much. That's great. Come and have a look, if you can, on your way out at Padmasambhava and uh, Vajrakilaya uh, and um, listen to Bante's talk. Yeah, it's well worth listening to. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.